Cross it. Hey everybody, Dr. O here. Welcome to our last chapter, chapter 20 on hunger and the environment. So this is, uh, you know, obviously we're going to talk about a lot, of, a lot of global issues, but there there's tons of food access issues in the United States. There's, um, we'll, call, we'll talk about food deserts and those types of things as well. So this is a local local problem and a global problem. You know, one of the things we talk about in class is um, where we should focus our efforts. And thankfully we can do both, but, um, you know, a lot of that is personal opinion. Okay, let's dive in. Does your university or community have a food bank? Which types of foods do they prefer to receive from donors? Why do you think they prefer some types of foods over others? So, uh, you know, it depends on where you're at here. But like, uh, you know, Western Iowa Tech has the Comet Cupboard, uh, which is, uh, and then also works, uh, I believe, with a food bank. And then we've got, uh, uh, I know they bring in fresh produce sometimes of the year and those sorts of things. So, so multiple food programs there. Other colleges would have different situations. Uh, you know, locally in Sioux City, there's the Soup Kitchen and the Gospel Mission would be some examples. And there's also the food bank. There's lots of places like that. Um, which types of foods do they prefer? Obviously, things that are uh, that aren't perishable, non-perishable items. You know, so perishable items like like produce would you know have to be um, turned around really quickly and get out to the people before they perish. Whereas a canned good is is you know, going to last a lot longer. Foods that don't need to be refrigerated or frozen would be easier for the food banks to handle as well. So why do you think they prefer some types of foods over others? Uh, all those reasons. So I know that. Uh, just depends on the situation. So I like the Gospel Mission in Sioux City, they get a lot of, uh, at least when I was uh, volunteering my time there, they were getting a lot of pizza from Little Caesars, but that, you know, it turned around quickly and they got rid of it before it went bad. Um, up here in Sioux Falls, the, the program we worked with here, they get a lot of uh, leftover stuff from Panera Bread. And then, you know, as long as it's, they get rid of it by the sell-by date, it appears to be uh, good to go there. So depends on the situation. All right, learning objectives. Identify some reasons why hunger is present in the United States. Identify some reasons why hunger is present in developing countries, and they're different, and then describe the consequences of nutrient and energy, energy inadequacies. Hunger in the United States. So you've got defining hunger in the United States, food security versus food insecurity. Um, I got some numbers here that'll be some American numbers, but also some global numbers as well. Uh, one in nine children are hungry worldwide. One child dies every 10 seconds uh, because of uh, starvation and malnutrition. That would be 5.9 million children a year. I mean, completely unacceptable. Uh, 42, mil 42 million Americans live in poverty and, uh, you know, 15% of people. And then that's uh, many of them living with under $11,770 per year of income, which, again, is a huge number compared to some parts of the world. But obviously the costs are so much higher here that that's a, a small number um, compared to other, other parts of the world as well, relatively speaking. Uh, and then we'll talk about food waste and a few other things that I have there later. But so food security means you basically know where your meals are coming from for the day. You know where your next meal is coming from. Food insecurity means you, you don't. Uh, you know we've talked about we've talked about um, uh, malnutrition. We've talked about starvation earlier. We've talked about fasting, right? Well, fasting being uh, on purpose and starvation being there's no food around. But um, so hunger, you've got no food. If there's too little food, then that's food insufficiency, and you just don't know where your next meal is coming from. That's that's what relates to that food insecurity. So people that are in those situations, they eat small meals, they skip meals, meaning they're having a hard time getting the nourishment they need. Um, and the, so we'll come back and talk more about, uh, like I said, food islands and things like that. But socially unacceptable ways people obtain food. So people, you know, dumpster diving, stealing food, these types of things. You know, it's like it's easy to it's easy to look down on those types of things because they are socially unacceptable. But um, if I was struggling to to be able to take you know to feed my my children, then I, I don't know what I I don't know what I'd be willing to do. Okay, so food poverty, and you, you see here this idea of food security. So most people. In the United States are in food secure situations, the 88.9%, um, low food security, 6.8% of the population, and very low food security, 4.3% of the population. And this is from the U.S. Department of Agriculture, but this would have been, um, you know, pre-COVID uh, pre numbers. The primary cause of, of food insecurity is poverty. I mean, obviously, if you can afford to buy food, then, then you will. But people have to choose between food and life's other necessities. Now, of course, there are situations where people are choosing alcohol or drugs over food, but, but it's usually, um, you know, paying rent, keeping the lights on, you know, the, these types of things. So that's, you know, that's why poverty is the leading cause of, of food insecurity. Um, other contributors to food poverty, alcohol or drug abuse. Lack of awareness of assistance programs, because there are a lot of them out there, uh, if you know where to look, and the reluctance to accept help. And there are people like that, too, that they clearly would qualify for help, but they don't want to, and they, they feel they feel bad about it, or they feel ostracized by, by doing it, these types of things. But 
I think sometimes we have to swallow our pride, and, and I'm glad that these federal entitlement programs exist. I'm glad that these organizations exist that will help people, you know, when they need help. Uh, of course, you know, the people that argue against those things would say that those people could be helping themselves. And, and yeah, I, I prefer giving people a hand up and helping them become more sustainable than I do just a hand out. But uh, especially when it comes to making sure kids are being well nourished, I mean, this is a generational thing. If we can if we can feed this generation well, then they will have better outcomes in the next generation and be able to take better care of their children and their children and their children. So it's a we need to break these poverty cycles. That's something that I've talked about. Uh, I'll, do, I'll put the presentation on YouTube sometime about uh, you know malnutrition in the brain and talk about breaking these generational cycles where um, you know you can't feed your children properly, so their brains don't fully develop, which means they'll never reach their potential, and, and this cycle, um, this cycle continues. Um, I think about uh, so obviously the population's affected. It's you know low socioeconomic status and, and, and things like that. All right, the obesity paradox, this kind of ties into this idea of living in, in food deserts and, and, and food insecurity. So it, it's a paradox because it doesn't make sense, but hunger implies inadequate food intake. Obesity implies excessive intake. So why is it that the highest rates of obesity occur with the greatest poverty? So I'll read what it says here and then I'll put my spin on it. A lack of healthful food choices occurring in low income or rural areas known as food deserts. Poor quality diets provide more kilocalories or calories, but few nutrients for less money. Um, food insecure people are not participating in food assistance programs are at a greater risk of obesity. So let's, let's start with the, the idea of a food desert. So how can we, why, why is it that the people that have the least amount of money to spend on food are the most likely to be obese? You would think that it would be the exact opposite. But lack of healthful food choices occurring in low income or rural areas known as food deserts. So a food desert is, there, is an area where you don't have easy access to nutritious food. So you're not, it's not that there's no food, but there's just not a lot of good food. So I'll tell you, like, I'm from a small town called Waterbury, Nebraska, and the only food you could buy in town was at the bar. And, you know, you could, so you could buy, like, these sandwiches you put in the microwave, like you get at a gas station. You could buy candy. You could buy, I guess, beef jerky would be about the healthiest thing. You could buy candy, chips. Um, there you might have been, there might might have been a little bread and milk, a few things you could grab in a sliding uh, case there, but, but that's what it was. Like, basically, so if we wanted food, we either had to go to the bar in town or we had to leave town to get it. And so we lived 25.6 miles from Sioux City where, uh, you know, we would go to the grocery store and these types of things. So you couldn't, you know, we, we couldn't just quickly run and grab produce and, and things like that. Now we started a garden and we tried, that's where I kind of got into gardening, gardening in my teenage years. But um, so again, how healthy can you be? And, and the world's changed a lot. I get it. Like if we, you know, we'd have Amazon packages bringing lots of food now nowadays, but back when I was a kid, that wasn't true. But think about a food desert. How I like to, how I like to get students like you to think about this is, Imagine um, that you had to design the healthiest diet you could, and all you could do is get gas, gas station food, right? So like right by Western Iowa Tech in Sioux City, there's a Casey's. What if you had to plan your entire week's meals by what you could get at Casey's there? Um, that's, that's, an, that's the idea of a food desert. Or um, I listened to a really good presentation last year at a men's event I went to where they were in a part of Chicago where they were basically 40 minutes away from healthy food. They had gas stations and liquor stores and they had fast food places w where they lived. But they, it would have been a 40 minute trip um, to go to like a, what we would consider a grocery store where you'd have um, access to all sorts of good things. Now, does the Casey sell some bananas and apples? Yeah, there's, there's a few things like that you can get. But could you truly design a nutrient dense whole food diet um, from gas station food? That's what, it, that's what it's like living in a food desert. So I gave you an example of a rural area that was a food desert and then a low income area that's a food desert as well. So that's that's what a food desert would be. Or I know like my my brother-in-law he used to live in New York City and I think they would they would make an hour and a half trip each way to go to where they wanted to get their groceries like it's just so you either had so if you live in a food desert you either take what you can get or you ex you spend a lot of extra time or and or money um, that you may not have. All right, so that's so that's so if you if you if you, have, if you don't have very many options, or if you do have options, even if you do have options, let's say there was a Whole Foods next door. If you couldn't afford to shop there, then you, then you wouldn't shop there. So the, here's the real problem. Here's where the paradox comes into play. Poor quality diets provide more calories, but few nutrients for less money. So basically the obesity paradox says that cheap food is more likely to have, it's going to be high in calories, high in fat, high in sugar, or high in carbs. It's going to be low in protein, low in vitamins, low in minerals. So the, the cheaper the food you eat, the 
you're gonna get a lot of calories, but not what you need to survive. So a good example, I was looking at, um, so my, uh, the smoothie I make in the morning, and this is, it's an expensive smoothie, right? I put um, fruit in it, often organic fruit. I use uh, uh, a fat-free Greek yogurt. I use whey pro a whey protein shake, which just, you know, just the just the whey protein, serving a whey protein is more, more than a dollar, probably a dollar seventy or something like that. Um, and then I put almond milk in it, which almond milk isn't cheap, right? So I don't even know what that costs, but let's say it cost me six, seven bucks. Uh, to make a smoothie in the morning, and it's and it's 370 calories, almost exactly. And the reason that that number stuck to me is that a, a pop tarts are, if you buy, you know, a, a serving of pop tarts, which is two pop tarts, 370 calories. So the same number of calories, but that pop tart, pop tarts are going to have uh, basically sugar and maybe I don't even know, but two or three grams of protein. So my breakfast is going to have 50 grams of protein, which for some of my sizes, and I'm a strength training athlete athlete using, using the word liberally, but uh, but um, I'm going to have 50 grams of protein and I'm going to have the carbs that I need and I'm going to have some healthy fats. The Pop-Tart, same number of calories, but two grams of protein. So if you ate, if you ate uh, nothing, if you ate Pop-Tarts for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, you would be, I mean, completely malnourished, but we'd have the same number of calories. So that's what, that's the problem. Cheap food is, is you, you're being underfed and overfed at the same time. Underfed calories, or sorry, overfed calories, overfed carbs, fats, or both. Uh, underfed vitamins, minerals, underfed protein. And that protein's a huge deal because I'm a big believer in what's called the protein leverage hypothesis, which says that we will eat until our protein needs are met. Met, needs are met. So if you're um, if you're eating low protein foods, you're going to be hungrier. And one of the best ways to stay full is um, more protein in your meals. And protein's expensive. Protein's way more expensive than carbs or fat. And, and a lot of that has to do with the fact that, you know, the commodity crops that the, you know, the government subsidizes things like corns and corn and wheat and soy. So when you buy, when you buy junk food or cheap food, it's almost always a combination of corn, wheat, soy, vegetable, because those things have been subsidized by the federal government. Farmers can basically sell them for less than the cost to grow them because the government subsidizes the difference. That's not true with broccoli and it's not true with protein, right? So um, that's, that's the paradox right there. The less money you have, the less protein, vitamins, and minerals you're going to eat, the more calories, carbs, and fats you're going to eat. So food insecure people not participating in food assistance programs are at greater risk of obesity because what, are they, what can they afford? Those Pop-Tarts. I saw at the store, I, I, after I looked at those stats, I looked at the store, for a 48 pack of, of Pop-Tarts is, is $11, less than $11, which means you could technically get 24 meals for $11. My smoothie, I couldn't make two of my smoothies for $11. So that you, you, you see the problem there. All right, so this is why these food assistance programs exist, to decrease the risk of disease for people that are food insecure. Oh, this is, this is explaining exactly what I just said, the poverty-obesity uh, paradox. Hungry, food insecure. Inadequate intake of, of protein, vitamins, and minerals. Maybe energy, right? In a, a globally, hunger-wise, energy is going to be a problem too. But in these food insecure areas, like in the United States, excessive intake of energy, fat, and sugar leads to obesity. So it's really it really depends on the situation. That's why uh, poverty in the United States leads to poor food choices. Poverty globally can lead to no food choices. And this is something that I said before. Like I, um, in the, in the talk I give on brain development and malnutrition. I always, I always tell my students and tell you right that I I, I think that you, you don't want to build your brain out of sugar. You don't. You want to build your brain out of healthy fats and protein and things like that. But a brain built out of sugar is going to be better off than a brain built out of nothing. And that's why, yes, the, the poverty obesity comp paradox in the U.S. leads to obesity, leads to chronic diseases, but um, malnutri serious malnutrition in the developing world leads to undersized brain development and loss of IQ, et cetera, et cetera. Thing I would consider those worse. Relieving hunger in the United States. So that's these assistance programs we've been talking about, federal food assistance programs, essential to supporting good health and achieving the public health goals of the United States. Completely agree. Supplemental nutrition assistance program, or the SNAP program, I believe is the biggest one. Participation significantly, significantly decreases food insecurity. Largest program in terms of dollars and people served. 44 million people, $70 billion. So it's obviously expensive, but we're looking at it, you know, and some people look at that and think, oh, we should be spending our money elsewhere. But those $70 billion are preventing lots and lots of chronic diseases and, and diseases that would cost us more if you look at Medicaid and things like that. Uh, types of food purchased, you generally they limit, you know, you, you, um, healthy, healthy grains, fruit juices, milk, eggs, those types of things generally. Um, few homeless people receive food assistance. And that's a big problem too, right? The people that need the most help, I mean, you have to have an address to get these things sent to you. You have to work with people to get these things, to get these, um, get these things off the ground. My wife, you know, she used to work for the county here and 
and her, she'd go out, she'd go around with a backpack and try to offer, you know, um, health care to homeless people. And I know it was very hard to get them involved in these programs, especially if they had mental illness or they were uh, abusing alcohol or drugs, etc. All right, so food waste, uh, the food recovery hierarchy. So food waste, I got a couple things I wrote down here. Um, Forty percent of food is wasted from the farm to the fork. You see there, from the source all the way down to the uh, to the end. Forty percent of our food is wasted, which means that the average American wastes more food than people in many countries eat. So we, we, again, we think about that when you're when you're wasting your food, uh, and our food demand is going to double. In the, in the next generation. So we can't afford to be, even we can't afford to be wasting this food. But the fact that there are places in the world where they don't have any food to waste is, is a big deal. So what are some ways that we can we can cut back on this food waste? I, I had mentioned like ugly produce once um, recently, uh, actually in the last video with, with organic, that there um, there's like, what is it called? The Misfits program or something now where you can, you can order ugly, you know, how uh, ugly fruits and vegetables and things like that. And there's lots of programs. But let's go ahead and look at this. So starting with source reduction. Reduce the amount of excess food produced and the amount of food waste generated. So obviously if we're, uh, you know, we, we shouldn't be throwing food away because it's ugly, but we shouldn't be producing more food than we need either. Uh, I think I thought about this. I thought on Instagram a few years ago, uh, it said that Pizza Hut was the number one purchaser of kale in the United States. And it's because they were decorating their salad, their, their salad bars with it. They weren't feeding it to people. They were using it as a decoration, right? There's an example of a superfood kale, one of the most you know nutrient dense plants on the planet. And it was being used as decoration. So I think that's a, that's a source reduction issue. Next, feed hungry people. Reuse safe and nutritious foods to feed hungry people through food banks, soup kitchens, and shelters. Love this idea, right? I would much rather have um, Little Caesars Pizza give their pizza to the Gospel Mission, which last I saw they did, than throw it in the garbage. Much rather. I think that all a Panera does it up here. I hope. I, I wish every place would. I know that there are issues with that. There's potential liability with that. I think the government needs to find a way to like you know loosen things enough where we with these things can safely be done, right? When you've got food that can feed starving people going into trash cans, I would like to minimize that as much as possible. So can we reuse food um, to feed hungry people? Love that idea. Feed animals. Maybe it isn't safe for human consumption, but it might still be safe for animal consumption. So reuse food scraps to feed animals on farms or in zoos or to make animal or pet food. Love that idea. Again, at least it's not being wasted. So we, we, we made the appropriate amount Whatever didn't get eaten could feed hungry people. Whatever can't be used for that can feed animals. Then we have industrial uses. Reuse wasted fats, oils, and grease as raw materials by rendering them into products such as soap, by converting them into biodiesel fuel, or by generating renewable energy from anaerobic digesters. We can literally turn our trash into fuel. That's pretty cool. Um, composting, which we ha I have a compost tumbler right above us here, and, and we're, we have a cold compost pile out this way. Um, recycle food waste by comp composting to create a nutrient-rich soil. So our, our food scraps that don't have meat, you don't put meat in it because then that gets the raccoons and other animals around, but our, our plant-based food scraps uh, are, are turned into soil that we use in our, when we use in our garden. So uh, we, we throw less food waste away and we actually turn it into something valuable. And then lastly, as an incineration or landfill, as a last resort, dispose of waste by burning or burying. So if we do all these things, they'll be, we, can, we can drop that food waste number from 40% from to way less. All right. Discussion question. Many college campuses make a variety of efforts to help students in the local community address issues such as food insecurity. Does yours? What can students do to help address this issue? So I know, like I said, Western Iowa Tech has the comic covered and they do multiple other things too. They work with the food bank, et cetera, et cetera. So food insecurity can be prevalent on some college campuses. Many campuses offer access to food pantries and food banks and other resources for students both on and off campus. Great, great idea. Um, I used to, I was part of, a, so the church I went to in Sioux City, I was part of the, we starting the team free lunch program we called it. And I love that. And we would do, because there are a lot of programs out there and people need help getting this. And because, you know, one of the big things we focused on were like um, toiletries and things like that. So we would feed people and we would offer some food, but we found that it was the things that they couldn't get with food stamps and SNAP and these kind of things that were more important. So we would do, um, you know, toothbrushes and toothpaste and shampoo and laundry, laundry detergent was a real big one. So I, I like when I see that college campuses are working with those kind of things too, because if people are taking advantage of the programs that exist, the federal assistance programs, then um, they, they, maybe they're getting a decent amount of food, but it's the other stuff that they're struggling to, to afford. All right, global hunger, world hunger issues, totally different scale. Just, just so you know, like you know, personally, um, I used to be, you know, uh, I, I always start my class off the first week with a with a d discussion about should we focus on U.S. hunger, global hunger, or both, whatever. 
Um, I, I used to be one of those people that says, you know, we need to take care of ourselves first. But, uh, you know, I've done I've worked with missionaries and done some work. And, and, you know, my stepson goes to India and things like that. And you just you need to realize that the, the global hunger issues are a lot different than our hunger issues. There, there are absolutely struggling people in the United States and there's no way they should. Right. We're the greatest country on the globe, on the planet. Nobody should be struggling here. I understand that. But um, when you've got like kids that go to the dump in India to find something to eat, you know, versus a, a kid in the United States where if we're taking advantage of these programs, like in Sioux City, they could go to the gospel mission and have lunch. They can get six pieces of pizza to take home with them. They can come back to the gospel mission for, for dinner, right? That's a different, it's a different situation. So, you know, I, I'm much more, uh, and, and then also because the cost of living is so different, our money can can make a bigger impact globally than it can. You know, I worked with a missionary in India years ago that said that every dollar is like forty dollars there, right? So, so that's my personal stance. I understand if it's not yours, but uh, so I feel like the the money that that the the money that I can afford to give can go much farther, and the people I'm helping are in a much worse situation than the, than the typical American. So that's my, my stance is that we, we focus more on issues globally. You know, we, um, we support um, several, several kids um, from Ethiopia and the money that we, the money that we spend to, to fully support these three kids and also help their families is it wouldn't be enough to make a huge dent in, in the, in the United States. So that, you know, that's my personal stance, but again, you think about that and you decide where, where you, where you fall. And then I, obviously the cool thing is we can do both, right? We can, we can find ways to help uh, both locally and globally. So here you see hunger hotspots and you see the parts of the world where um, the people are really struggling with hunger. The sub-Saharan Africa, it would be it would be a big area there. Um, usually we're looking at, the, we'll talk about numbers like this or, or, or terms like this, but it's where we've reached our carrying capacity, right? The, the parts of the globe where you have um, the highest populations or at least the fastest growing populations or the highest birth rates are usually the parts of the world where they're struggling to find uh, enough food. So if you've got, you know, in the United States, we have a relatively small population on a massive area and we have tons of land. We can definitely sustain ourselves in, in the United States, but in smaller countries with, with, um, with soil that's not as good as ours and things like that, less technology, they're having a harder time producing food and there's more people per per square foot, right? So they basically, they've reached what's called their carrying capacity. And that's when you start to see serious issues. All right, um, so pause and answer these questions. The world's population continues to increase even as the rate slows. So if you, you see population growth going up like this, it's the rate is slowing, so the line is flattening a bit, but it's still growing. And um, like I said, you know, we're, we're we're real close to getting towards to eight billion here. All right, these numbers threaten the Earth's carrying capacity to provide adequate food and safe water. So the question of carrying capacity, I look at it generally more locally. Like it's not that there are too many people on the planet, maybe uh, my my stance, but they're in the wrong place. Like everyone everyone could live in in, in an area the size of Florida, right? As long or or a little bit bigger, as long as um, you know we had all the the available resources. So it's it's not generally an issue of there being too many people, but they're just in places where they can't handle them. So I, I don't know if we reach the Earth's carrying capacity, but some parts of the planet, absolutely the carrying capacity has been reached. And you're, you've got like, what do you got? 1.4 billion people living in China and, and, and things like that. So, uh, but the carrying capacity is a big deal because at some point there can't be enough food and water for the people that exist. And I don't know what that number is, but we are getting closer to it because our population is increasing. Much of the population increase is occurring in developing countries. That's what I was saying before. Where you're seeing the population get bigger is in places where they can't afford to have more people. Hunger and malnutrition are already widespread in such countries. So malnutrition, uh, a few different types here. I got a couple definitions as, as well. Uh, acute malnutrition, so recent severe food restrictions. So, the, the, so not over your entire life. So you'd be underweight for your height. That would be a wasting, uh, a wasting disease. So be, where lack of weight, um, stunting is a, is a height issue. So let's say you were you know properly fed for a few years, but then then something happened, bad uh, bad season for crops or whatever, and all of a sudden you you severe food restrictions and that would affect your um, your weight. So you're losing weight because you'd be forced to be on a diet, basically. That's acute malnutrition. Chronic malnutrition is long-term food deprivation. It would lead to you being underweight, but also a short height for your age, so a stunting. So it'd be both a stunting and wasting disease, if you want to call it that. Um, so this would be for most of your life or all of your life, food's been hard to come by. And this is the kind of malnutrition that I've mentioned. Uh, if it occurs in the first, I, the, book, the book must be at the office and work, but um, if, it, if it affects you in the, I swear I had it here, doesn't matter. Um, 
the first thousand days are critically important to the development of your brain. So from conception to the end of your second year, if you're experiencing malnutrition, it will impact brain development and, and, the, and the impact will be permanent. We talked earlier about like critical developmental periods where there's permanent uh, permanent scars left on you basically um, during development. But those first two years of life, same thing. If your brain is underdeveloped at the end of those thousand days, uh, you, you, you can improve it, but you can't make up for the make up the difference. Uh, the two big two big forms of malnutrition we have here are kwashiorkor and marasmus. So I've got to, so kwashiorkor, you see here, um, uh, severe severe malnutrition, failure to grow and develop. Marasmus, severe malnutrition, poor growth and dramatic weight loss. Weight loss. So they are different. Um, marasmus, I believe, means again. I don't remember the the origin of the words, but marasmus, I believe, means a dying away, where the growth growth is going to stop. So marasmus is going to be a severe energy malnutrition. Now kwashiorkor, um, let's see here. Where did I write that down? I know I wrote it down. It was, uh, it was here we go. Sorry. Uh, kwashiorkor comes from uh, uh, a dialect in Ghana. And the, the, the word means um, the sickness the baby gets when the new baby comes. So it's called, it would be the uh, deposed child. So what that means is the, the name comes from the fact that when a mom has another baby and starts breastfeeding them, the older kid is now losing the breast milk and then they will develop kwashiorkor. So let's look at the differences. They're both, they're both very similar. Uh, but there's one, one major, major difference that I want to talk about here. So see if you can answer these questions. Pause if you need to. Muscle wasting not apparent, due, so it's occurring, but not apparent, due to edema of the face, limbs, and abdomen because of a protein deficiency, that's kwashiorkor. Um, marasmus, the next one, scant energy and protein in the diet, so there is some protein in the diet, uh, impairs brain development, body slows metabolism, and lowers your core temperature, that's marasmus. So the big difference is marasmus is an energy deficiency. This kid is starving, but they have some protein, either a little bit of protein in the diet or some protein still in their reserves. There's, there aren't real protein reserves, so they're still, they have muscle they can feast off of, maybe heart muscle, things like that. Not good. But kwashiorkor is worse because this is a protein and energy deficiency. So let me finish this slide and then I'll explain the difference. Recent severe food deprivation, underweight for height and wasting disease, that'd be acute. If it's chronic, it leads to stunting of height as well. So long-term food deprivation, short for their age and stunting. So there, um, oh, sorry, let's go back to those two terms. So the, how I look at this is there's basically two kinds of starving children and there shouldn't be any. But if a kid is just, if a kid is really skinny, then they have marasmus, but they must still have some protein. If a kid is skinny, but puffy, like they have a, a swollen abdomen, looks like they have a pot belly, or like, like it says, they're swelling in the face and limbs. They have kwashiorkor. And this kid is in a worse situation because they have, um, basically protein is in your blood because, and it's needed because we, we filter fluid out of our circulatory system. That it bathes our cells and nutrients and all that. And then the protein and the nutrients in our blood uh, and the cells in our blood, they suck that fluid back in. So you don't, you don't have to know the numbers, but a typical adult, you know, about 24 liters of fluid is filtered out of your capillary beds every day. And then 20.4 of those liters is sucked back in by osmosis. And proteins in the blood are, are a big, big part of that. Um, albumin being the most important one. It's called the plasma protein. Your liver makes it. So um, if you're filtering out all this fluid, but you don't have enough protein to suck it back in, you'll develop edema. So this would be um, in the United States, if you saw somebody that had a swollen abdomen um, from fluid, it's called ascites, and it would be from liver failure usually, you know, alcoholic cirrhosis or, or liver cancer, or whatever. If you see a, a, a child in the developing world that has the same situation, what's happening is there's no protein in their diet. So in the, in the situation of cirrhosis, your liver is too damaged to take the proteins from your diet and build albumin. In, in this issue, situation with kwashiorkor, um, there's no protein. The liver's, the liver's probably fine, but they don't have the amino acids they need to build albumin. So if, you, if you're so protein deficient that your body can't even recollect fluid, then you have the, 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 the liver or the, the ascites in the abdomen, the swollen face, swollen limbs, that's kwashiorkor, and that is worse. So they're both bad, but if someone has marasmus, a um, little more hope because at least they're not severely protein deficient. If they have kwashiorkor, um, they, are, they are closer to death, and these both of them are emergencies that need to be dealt with. Okay, sustainable actions. Uh, diet composition and the environmental food print. So I, I wrote a few things down here as well um, as far as feeding people. 
So you know I'm a huge fan of um, of, of animal products, you know, uh, healthy animal products and from animals that are taken care of and all those kind of things. But um, when it's just you know bare minimum, like I'm I'm focusing on trying to put on muscle and get stronger in the gym. If you're focusing on survival, then your diet's probably going to look different. Um, all right. So so food the food industry consumes about 20% of our energy. So there's you know there's a big uh, there's a big footprint there. Talking about the environmental footprint. Uh, in general, meat diets use two and a half times as much energy as, as all plant-based diets. Um, Range-fed livestock, uh, livestock use uh, you know, enough grain that could feed 400 million people. Uh, and then livestock consumes about, about 10% more. So, so again, it takes, it takes about 10 times as much grain to feed a cow that you're going to then eat than it would be for you to eat the grain. Now, there's some that's true, but also, you know, there's tons and tons, even in the United States globally as well, there's tons and tons of land that isn't um, suitable for growing grains and having ranging animals there is a brilliant strategy. So I think we have to be smart about it. I don't think it's all plant-based versus animal-based. And I don't, you know, um, I don't think that going plant-based is, is going to save the world the way people think it will but absolutely there are times it makes sense but if you have land that can't you can't grow crops on it then you can you can still turn that into calories for humans to consume by having grazing animals on it so i just again just i think that we need to look a little deeper in this topic it's not as black and white as um the uh, you know like it says here the best options are vegetarian not vegan because or having small amounts of meat and dairy because they they meet needs that it's harder for your plant-based foods to meet so i i completely agree with that uh mostly plant-based diet getting you know if 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 there's not a lot of food to go around some meat some dairy uh, um, or at least a vegetarian diet, meaning that you can have things like meat, you can have eggs, those kind of things. A uh, vegan diet, it, it is harder to, uh, you know, a thoughtful vegan diet can be great, but it's, it's harder to get all the calories and nutrients you need, especially when you're developing. All right, um, so diet composition and environmental footprint, we talked about some of that. Best options are vegetarian, not vegan, with small amounts of meat and dairy, which means it wouldn't really be vegetarian, but you get the idea, a, a heavily plant-based diet. Habits and benefits, uh, we've covered some of those. Lifestyle choices to consider environmental consequences. We talked about energy. Um, sustainable agricultural practices. So can we reduce waste? Can we reduce energy? Can we reduce runoff and pesticides? All those kind of things. Uh, comparable crop yields to less sustainable methods, which is always good. If you can make something more sustainable, why not? We'd like humans to be here for a long time, right? Leaving plant remnants in the field as mulch. So doing uh, no-till, you know, no-till crop production, etc. Conserve resources and reduce waste, all great. And select meal patterns that meet the needs without excess. If you know if 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 food issues are, are a problem, we just can't afford to be wasting. Okay, summary. Now the lesson is over. Identify some reasons why hunger is present in the United States. We talked about poverty being the big one. We talked about food deserts. Identify some reasons why hunger is present in developing countries, just reaching those carrying capacities, not having uh, the resources available to feed as many mouths as there are and describe the consequences of nutrient and energy inadequacies. We talked about uh, Kwashi Orkor versus Merasmus there. Okay, I hope this helps. I hope this entire um, series has been about 25, 26 hours worth of videos now. I hope that this series has been extremely helpful and I hope you've learned a tremendous amount. I love teaching this class because you learn things that'll help in your program like every other class that I teach, but um, you can take things from this class that can change your life and change your family's life forever in ways that I can't do in anatomy and microbiology. So it's one of the reasons I love teaching nutrition. I hope that this helped. You have a wonderful day. Be blessed.